Open your Bibles, if you will, to the second chapter of the book of Luke. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Classic sermons by Pastor Ed. Luke chapter 2, re reading verses 1 through 20. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when uh, Cyrenus was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into uh, to Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with his Mary, Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought first, her, forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Didn't mean they didn't have any money to want anywhere to stay. There's a big difference. So, oh, it was so poor. He didn't have any. Oh, they, it says because there was no room for them. And they went to the inn. They didn't have any room, so they had to go somewhere. <clears throat> and there were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel of the Lord, uh, the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now let me just correct this because the Greek literally says, uh, it says peace towards men of goodwill. All right? So, you know, and, you know, we, always, we always like to say on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The Greek literally says peace on earth, I mean peace towards men of goodwill. What's that mean? If you don't have goodwill, you don't get peace. All right? Hallelujah. And it, came, uh, so, and it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into the heaven. The shepherds said one to another, let us go, now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made it uh, known abroad the same which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered as those things which were told by the shepherds. But Mary kept all things and pondered them in her heart. And the, she and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Now, real quick for our, uh, for our lesson, we, we know this, or we should have known this by now. Uh, the, the three wise men were not there that night. Okay? Actually, they came and found him in a house. About, he was about two years old when they did find him. And, uh, you know, the Magi traveled um, in, about, in caravans of about 60. So, um, <clears throat> We Three Kings of Orient are. It's a cool song. We can't sing it, Chris. We put the little wise men in our manger scenes and our, our nativities, if you're from here. Nativity, if you're from somewhere else. Uh, hallelujah. If you look at the dictionary, both of them are, are considered now correct. Yeah. But uh, since I'm preaching, it's nativity. All right? You can call it nativity if you want to. Just not around me. And caps, caps calls it nativity. I'm like, what is a nativity? Never heard of one. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. But the, but the Magi actually traveled in caravans of about 60. They found, this, they found him around the age of two years old. We know that because when, the, when uh, Herod sent out to have all the children killed, he did it from, the, from all children two years and under from about the time that he had diligently inquired of them. So they showed up about the time he was two years old. And only the shepherds showed up the night of, of his birth. Now this is just for accuracy's sake so that we, people know we know what we're talking about. Because, you know, people say, well, these Christians, they don't even know that they weren't there. Well, we do know they weren't there. All right? Hallelujah. Now, in fact, they showed up, you know, we, we call the three wise men because of the three gifts, primarily gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That was his dowry for his ministry. Jesus was given a dowry for his ministry by the Magi. And so with 60 showing up with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, he, had, he, he was ready to go. You know, God wants to make provision for your ministry. You know, for us to do the things that God called us to do. Amen? <clears throat> Hallelujah. So the shepherds went back out. Now, so this morning's message title is something I've preached a number of years ago. I've preached it a couple of times over the years. But the child grew up. See, we, in our society, people, as a general rule, don't have any problem with Jesus, the babe, and the manger. 
They'll get. They'll come in. Even they don't like. They don't want to serve Jesus Christ the Lord. They don't want to be a Christian. They'll sing, "Away in a manger, no crib for a bed." You know, the little Lord Jesus. And they all get all kind of syrupy over the baby Jesus. I mean, I'm being real here, folks. And, you know, they'll, they'll talk about the silent night, holy night. They'll talk about, you know, angels we've heard on high. They'll, they'll think about the baby in the manger. And why? Because babies are innocent. Babies are non-threatening. You don't have to submit to babies. Come on now. You don't, have to, you don't have to yield your life to a baby. You are in control. So a lot of people have no problem with Jesus as the babe because there is no control of their life. There's no, there's no demand on their life. There's nothing. They can just, oh, the little sweet babe. Oh, he's so, I mean, you know, people and babies, I mean, you can have the meanest, honoriest, I mean, nastiest, vilest personality person in the world. A lot of times they walk up to a baby and go, oh, look at the baby. Uh, so keep it, and look at you with I mean, evil eye. Hello? I mean, they, they could be, they could be honoring you and see about oh, the baby. Now, here's an example. <clears throat> There's a YouTube video out there, and I, and I think I think it's a cougar kills a um, monkey. But after it killed the monkey, it I mean, when it rolled it over, it found it had a baby in its pouch attached. It was holding onto it. That cougar took that baby, picked it up, moved it, and wrapped its paws around it and played with its head and all kinds of stuff all night long. Now it, 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 the baby monkey died from exposure. But that, that, then all of a sudden these instincts kick in and it's trying to nurture because it's a baby. It's throughout everything. People just love babies. And so people love Christmas. You know, I, I guarantee you, you don't, you don't have half or, or a third the emphasis on Easter as we do on Christmas. Why? Because there's no threat there. There's no threat at Christmas. There's no, there's no, there's no threat of the baby coming into the world. And, um, but I've got news for you. The babe grew up. Amen. Are you here? Amen. He didn't stay a baby in the manger. <coughs> Hallelujah. It, people remain in control as long as they're a babe. Luke chapter 2, verse 39 through 40 says, And when all things performed according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee and to their own city. And listen to this, verse 40, And the child grew, waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And so we have Jesus... You know, from the time he was born, the next time we have a, an account of Jesus is uh, about two years old, right there in the same passage almost, where the, where the, the, uh, the Magi, or the, sh the wise men came, uh, and, and they found him in the house, and they came to the house. Remember, if you study, they came to the house. They didn't go to the manger, came to the house. He was about two years old at that time. Next time we have an account of Jesus is when he's 12. He's at the temple, and his parents leave and leave him behind, and, he's, and they come back three days later and find him, you know, arguing or, or discussing stuff with the, uh, the, the lawyers and the doctors of the law, with the Pharisees and so forth, and they, they, they ask him, why did you do this? He said, didn't you know I need to be about my father's business? From that point to the time he's 30, we hear nothing else. What we do know is, according to Luke's gospel right here in verse 40, he grew and waxed strong in spirit, and the grace of God was upon him. He was not out making clay pigeons fly. He wasn't traveling around in caravans all over the world. He wasn't, you know, you know doing weird stuff. As a matter of fact, his, his testimony about his life was, is this not uh, Jesus, Joseph's son, the carpenter? Hello. Until he was 30 years old, that's all we know. Why? Because he was growing and getting ready for his ministry. <coughs> so, but the child grew up. Jesus didn't say a babe in the manger. Are you here? Jesus came to a point in life where he left, his, he left his trade of carpentry. And he went and came to the place where John the Baptist was baptizing people. And John the Baptist saw him coming and said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And Jesus came to him and John said, I have need to be baptized of thee. Remember what John the Baptist said? There's one that comes after me who's mightier than I. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. When Jesus showed up, John said, you don't need the water baptism. I need your Holy Ghost baptism. But Jesus said it has to be done. And so he, he baptized me. And then when he came out of the water, a dove descended on him and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Glory to God. He was led of the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted of the devil 40 days. And after those days, he was a hungered. Hallelujah. And the Satan came to him and, you know, began to say, if you be the son of God, turn this stone into bread. He said, thou shalt not, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Are you here? And then he went on and said, you know, uh, uh, took him to the pinnacle of the temple, showed, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said, all these things have been given to me, and I'll give them to you if you'll but bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, you know, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou worship. 
Hallelujah. Then he took him to a high place on the temple and, and, and said, Cast thyself down from here, for it's written, and the angel shall bear thee up, lest thou dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus responded and said, It's also written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And Satan departed from him a season. And the Bible says he came back in the power of the Spirit and went into the t- synagogue and took the scroll where, uh, as his custom was, and took the scroll and found a place in the book of Isaiah where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord's upon me and started his ministry. Praise God. I know that was a real quick recap. Hallelujah. You know? Amen. I was just getting after because I got to get to something. The child grew up. Jesus didn't stay in the manger. And I'm going to say something here. If it, was, if it was not for the death, burial, and resurrection, there would be no Christmas. Now, and I, I, I'm going to say this because, you know, we, we've taught this before. The word Easter is, is a really bad, it's not even a translation. They just stuck it in there. It comes from the Greek word Ishtar which is the Greek goddess of fertility. And the King James translators, at the time that they were translating the King James Bible, got to that word, which is paschal in the Greek. It's not even Ishtar in the Greek, in the the text. It's not even Paschal. Ishtar is paschal, Passover. But because it had become known in the region at that time as calling that date Easter, they just went ahead and stuck it in there. It was just, it it wasn't even a mistranslation. They deliberately did it just because they were associating that day with what was going on. Horrible. So we call it Easter. We do not celebrate the Greek goddess of fertility. Be honest with you. Now, if you call it that, don't freak out. I'm just letting you know what, what really took place there. Because, you know, you, you could call it by Easter in the Bible. Not really. <clears throat> the King Jimmy guys did. Okay? That bunch, a bunch of Scots and uh, Irish and Gaelics and uh, Brits all got together and trying to do a unified kingdom Bible. And they just didn't do it. They made some, anyway. Hallelujah. But if it weren't for, that, if it weren't for the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we would not even be celebrating Christmas. Are you here? So as we come into this Christmas time, as we come up to this day, remember Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He is not a babe in the manger. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He reigns over the earth as supreme commander. Hallelujah of the host of heaven. Glory to God. He is your redeemer. He shed his blood to redeem you out of destruction. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now let's talk about a couple things here. Um, as a man, as a resurrected Lord, well, I, I better, I guess, you know, Philippians 2 8, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But then Romans 8 9, uh, 10, I'm sorry, Romans 10, 8, 9, 8, 9 10, and 11, what saith that the word is not thee? Even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, bodily, physically, Literally, it wasn't real. It was just a spiritual thing. That was, that's what the, uh, the Gnostics said in their day. Our modern-day Gnostics are Christian scientists, Scientologists. Now, well, not, not Scientology of the uh, you know, R. Ron Hubbard stuff. I'm talking about the church, the, the church Christian science. Okay? R. Ron Hubbard started that whole, L. Ron Hubbard started that whole uh, uh, Dianetics or whatever it was called to start with and now it's a whole religion called Scientology and he just made it up said he could make up a religion and people would buy into it and they did mostly Hollywood they live in a fantasy world anyway but, sci- but our, our Christian scientists today are the ones who say that the natural is not real that's, that, that's just Gnosticism and they were dealing with that in that day no Jesus was literally physically raised from the dead he died physically, shed his blood physically, was physically raised up. He has a flesh and bone body. He said, touch me, hand to me. See, because spirit has not flesh and bone. That, Jesus knocked their argument in the head, didn't he? Did that a lot. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Um, for, um, so raise it from the dead, thou shalt be safe. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him should not be ashamed. He, Hebrews 10, 11 says, but this man after he offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down on the right hand of God. Hallelujah. And so we have here, you know, a very quick synopsis of Christmas to Easter. And I just use that term because everybody uses it. But I've explained where I understand what it means. All right. We, we really serve, we serve, the, we serve or we, we recognize the resurrection day of Jesus. Okay, taking place after, at, during Passover. All right, Paschal. He was a Paschal lamb. Glory to God. From that, we, we just gave you a quick synopsis. Jesus was born. Jesus grew up. Jesus went to the cross. Jesus died. Jesus shed his blood. Jesus was raised from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, you got to do something with the resurrected Jesus much more than you do with the babe Jesus. 
Now I've got nativities, nativities, in my house, just like everybody else. You know, my, my, I, I got a relative um, that has about 4,000. That might be an exaggeration. <laughs> they keep the Christmas stuff up all year long. Got a room, a Christmas room. It's everywhere. Jesus and Santa's. We finally found some Santa's worshiping Jesus and gave that to them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's my mom. She's got, she loves, she's got, a, she's got a, a, a love for, for Santa and nativity. So uh, I, we, we finally found that we, we just, we just bu- took both worlds by the horns and said we got it. Found a Santa that worships at the nativity. Praise God we got it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, you, you're talking about being able to take care of both of them at the same time. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Every, every niche about. But the fact of the matter is, you're coming into Christmas, we'll sing all those songs, you'll, get, you'll kind of get, you know, oh, it's so sweet. You're talking about the Bethlehem star, but I want to ask you a question. What are you going to do with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Because he's no longer in that manger. He's no longer a babe in that manger. He, he grew up, became a man, went to the cross and shed his blood. Heaven opened up and, you know, and, and God said, this is my beloved son. God laid his judgment on him. Hallelujah. For, for our sin and our rebellion against God. And then God raised him from the dead and sat him at his own right hand where he ever lives to make intercession for us. And the demand now is not to be honoring the babe in the manger. The demand now is to submit your life to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So I've got a question for you. What are you doing with the resurrected Lord? Amen. Not the babe in the manger, but the resurrected Lord because the babe grew up. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The Bible says there, confess him as Lord. You know, the, um, whosoever shall confess him as Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised from the dead, you'll be saved. Now, I've heard a lot of different definitions for the word Lord. But, uh, <coughs> so I did a study. And, um, you know, I've got a, I've got a real good uh, volume of books. But one, it's out of print now. It's actually on electronic media now. Thank God. Because it's about 40 books called the Complete Biblical Library. I mean, it was done by, by scholars of Hebrew and Greek, and they just went into depth of a bunch of stuff. And uh, the Greek stuff is really good because they take the classical use that was used in classical Greek, took the use of it when it was used in the Septuagint, which is the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew and Chaldean and, Arama- and, and maybe some Aramaic, and translate that into Greek. And so then you come into the New Testament usage, and a lot of times how they use the, the Greek word to translate certain Old Testament words in a theological perspective had wear, bearing and weight on how it was used in the New Testament in the modern Greek language of the day. And so there's just really good studies here. So we're going to talk about the word Lord. Now, I've heard people say, you know, what well, the word Lord really means, bread provider. And, you know, and, 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 you know, sometimes we'll pick those things up and start sharing them and then go back and study it. Well, I, I can't really find that. Because you know what the word Lord means, curios? It means supreme controller. Owner, master, Lord. You're confessing him as supreme controller, owner, master, and Lord of your life. All right. Now, originally, curios was an adjective which meant to have authority or power. The term also functioned as a noun, which in the case it meant Lord or master or ruler. Uh, it could be addressed, reserved for those of a superior status like sir. Uh, in classical Greek, uh, curios might be applied to the gods, but, not, but it was not usually a divine title. In classical Greek, I mean, sorry, that did not happen until later during the Hellenistic period when the Oriental emperors over the Greek people took the title for themselves, according to their custom. Later, Roman emperors also employed the title curios to themselves. They also promoted the notion of an emperor worship and considered themselves divine. This is when this title became used to have religious connotations. Since Christians were unable to acknowledge such gods, they often met with severe persecution from government officials by not referring to him as Lord. Okay. Then the Septuagint uses the word 9,000 times to translate different Hebrew words. In the Old Testament, curios is, is used 9,000 times. Uh, equals such words as Adahan, uh, Baal, uh, the Aramaic term Mary, which is where we get the word Maranatha from, uh, which all meant Lord. Furthermore, Gervu, G-V-I-R, commander, Shalit, which is ruler, are also translated by curios. Now, this, this is different. Now, about 3,000 times it's used for those different words. But first and foremost, Curios notes God's name as it is depicted in the Tetragrammaton, literally the four-letter word, Y-H-W-H, where we get Yahweh from. Okay? Now, Yahweh is also, uh, which is, is the non-German translation. How many know what the German translation for Y-H-W-H is? Jehovah. Okay? So the Germans translated Y-H-W-H because they don't have a Y in German. I mean, at that time, they used the J for the Y instead, and they put in their vowels, and it became Jehovah. 
You know, the W was a V, I mean, you know. They have Volkswagens. They don't have Volkswagens. They have Volkswagens. All right? You ride around the Volkswagen. Now I got a Volkswagen. Now you got a Volkswagen. All right. So YHWH is translated Yahweh. A lot of, you know, Yah, his name is Yahweh. All right, anyway, glory to God. Or Jehovah, the same word. It came from the same four-letter word for Lord. All right? Thus, Kyrios occurs 6,000 times in the, new, in the Septuagint for YHWH in reference to Lord. So this word, when it was brought into the New Testament and used, carried that underlying significant uh, um, understanding of Lord, the Supreme Lord. Amen. Are you here? He's the Lord God Almighty. He's Lord. He's Supreme Controller. He's Master. Amen. He's your ruler. He's your Lord of your life. Amen. We don't want to confess Him as our bread provider. We confess Him as our Master, our Lord. I, mess, I know I'm messing with some folks' this mess this morning. I'm just going to mess. Mess with some stupid doctrine. <clears throat> I got a lot of reading to do now. Of the more than 700 times Curios occurs in the New Testament, 200 in Luke's writings, and nearly 280 belong to Paul. Used in refer- now, when used in reference to men, Curios re- ordin- uh, re- ordinarily has its um, normal Greek understanding. So somebody was a lord or whatever, it was just back to the, of authority. Didn't carry the religious connotation when it was used that way. It could, make, it could signify the owner of a, uh, either animate or inanimate objects, like being lord of all, master of the house, owners of a cult, the master of servants, of slaves. Many more usages, and this meant somebody was in authority. But like the Old Testament usage, curious, in the New Testament also, also functions as the name of God. Each person of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are called curios. In, in the following text, and I'm, I'm not going to use, re, give you all the text difference. Well, I'll give them to you. It is the equivalent of Adhan, uh, Mark 12, 11, Psalm 18, uh, 118, 22, Mark 12, 36, in reference to Psalm 110, 1, Psalm, Acts 4, 26, and Psalm 2, 1. Okay, that's why I've got streaming. You can go back and listen to it. God is frequently called Lord of the Old Testament citations. And allusions found in the New Testament. In other words, there are references to God in the Old Testament, where he's called Lord, and then there are allusions back to that where he's called Lord. Now, one of the things you'll find out about the Holy Spirit, the works attributed to God in the Old Testament are attributed to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. That means the Holy Spirit's who? God. He's not just a he's not cosmic cloud floating out there. He's the third person of the Godhead. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Um, let's see. The Father exercises authority as Lord over all his created universe. Jesus praised him with his address, calling him Lord of heaven and earth. This authority is primarily a result of the fact that he is the creator of the universe. Well, when you create the whole thing, you're in charge of it. You're the master of it. Amen? All right? Um, God had, that made the world and all that is therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth. Acts 17, 24. God is the Lord of mankind. Let me say something. There's some teachings going around in the body of Christ today that are erroneous. They make out that God doesn't have any control over your life, that you don't have to submit, you don't have to obey, you don't have to be yielded to, and that's just not Bible. Jesus grew up. Jesus went to the cross. Jesus shed his blood. He was raised as Lord of lords and King of kings, glory to God. And we yield our life to him in complete. You can't hold anything back. Now here's the wonderful thing. He won't do anything to hurt you. Remember the guy came to Jesus one day and said, good master. He said, why call me good? There's only one good, save God alone. Are you calling me God? I want you to know God is good. I said, God is good. When you yield your life to him in complete surrender, he won't hurt you. He'll do good to you, glory to God. I mean, whether Candy State had that song, I can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? And God's not going to do bad to you. He's not going to do bad stuff to you. Amen. You said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall the Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask Him? Glory to God. He said, you natural people know how to give good gifts. How much more shall the Father? God is good. God's not going to give you cancer. I said, God's not going to zap you with something you don't want. Leukemia. Now, I know dumb folks have preached that, but it's not Bible. 
Did, you say, did I say dumb folks? Uninformed people. That's nicer. Is that nicer, Neen? All right. Neen said that was nicer. All right. God is the Lord of mankind, the Lord of the harvest. He is the Lord of his church. He's the master of his vineyard. He has at his disposal human instruments who carry out the work of proclaiming his salvation. Since the Lord is Lord in the ultimate sense, he is, moreover, the Lord of history, who sovereignly governs all the earth powers and rulers. He is the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So glory to God. We note, now this is the, the writers of the Complete Biblical Library, that Kyrios is the name most frequently applied to Jesus Christ. This extensive use of the name obviously is because the writers invested this term with more than just an ordinary meaning. The title is applied in its ultimate and divine sense to Jesus. Jesus, Lord, chiefly refers to the elevated and glorified Christ. It is a title which God has given him in response to his saving work. Wherefore, because of his abasement and death, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. God has, through the resurrection and ascension of Christ to the right hand of the Father, made that same Jesus both Lord and Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. You cannot come to Jesus simply as the Savior without coming to him in submission to him as Lord. There's a lot of people looking for the life-saving tube from the ship, but don't want, when you get on the boat, you don't want to have to obey the guy that saved you. He's both Christ and Lord. I mean, we already told you, it means supreme controller, master, ruler, Lord. Somebody say glory. <coughs> the Lordship of Christ is especially related to the church. Christ is, above all else, the Lord of his people. His body, he is our Lord Jesus Christ. One of Paul's most frequent, frequently used description of Jesus' relationship to his people. Wow. There is a relationship between Jesus and the people, and it is his lordship. Now understand, he's still the loving, caring Jesus who destroys yokes and removes burdens. He's still the Jesus that saves us out of destruction, but he is Jesus who is Lord. His relationship to the church is he is our Lord. We are in utter, to be in utter and complete submission to his authority. I don't like that. That's because you want to be in charge. You're a control freak. Hello? You need to stop being a control freak and give it to him. Control, control freaks don't do real good. I just want you to know that, folks. Control freaks lose out. Are y'all here? You're going home. Thank you for your enthusiasm. All right. Let me get back here reading. This is good stuff. Is this good? It's very, why, why didn't you just say it your own self? Because I can't say any better than they're saying it. These are the guys with the PhDs. Hallelujah. Paul, you, Paul uniquely emphasized Christ's lordship over the, over the hev heavenly angelic powers. The underlying assumption is that the fall of man and his, his subsequent rebellion against God has cosmic dimensions. Christ brings everything into subjection to his lordship. Everybody will be subsumed under his leadership. All powers are essentially conquered through his death and resurrection. The main battle uh, has been won. Satan's empire has been upended still. There remains an ultimate battle, and everything will be under Christ's power and rule. For he, listen, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet, 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Now, folks, if you think they're all under his feet, you're wrong, because the Bible says he's going to continue reigning until they're all put under his feet. They're not under his feet. They're not all under his feet. They're still rebelling. If you don't believe that, go look at what's going on in the world today. Hello? There's junk going on everywhere. There's trash going on everywhere. And if you don't agree with the, the lunatics and the devil, the demonized minded people, then you're on intolerant and mean and hateful. You can't say what the Bible says because you're vile. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I'm not going to Cracker Barrel anymore. 
Cracker Barrel has withdrawn support of took, taking uh, the duck dining and stuff with the fuel space on it out because they, they don't want to be associated with his vile comments. They're taking them off the shelf. Well, you know, I'm, Lebanon's getting a letter next week. Tennessee. From the Taylor house. That, I'm rep that You don't represent my values. Hello? If you, can't, if you can't say what the Bible says without... We're called intolerant when we say what the Bible says. Now, listen to this. When the agenda of the world is you have to accept sin, you have to accept perversion, you have to accept everything that's ungodly, and you have to embrace it, and that's love. That's not love. That's capitulation. Amen. Hello. I don't want to be like the French. Remember, anybody ever heard the joke about the French during World War II? They sold their weapons. Never used, only dropped once. What do you mean? When the, when the, when the Germans came in, they, just, they, they capitulated. They said, come on in. We're going to drink our wine and, and, and have love fest. Now, I know they had the resistance. I, know, I get all that. It's a joke. And it's a funny joke. Hello? You got Christians right now who are just like that. New Bible, never used, only dropped once. They capitulated this first time somebody gave them a little press persecution or somebody came out against them. I serve the master. I, I, speak, I speak what the master says. I don't speak what the world tells me to speak. I'm not going to say, you know, in Canada, you can't even preach about homosexuality. It's a hate crime in Canada for pastors to speak against homosexuality. You can go to jail as a pastor for saying homosexuality is a sin. You can't preach the Bible. And don't think, don't think it, folks, unless we stand up and serve Jesus and say what the Word says, it's coming to America, and it's for closer than you think. Man can't even go on an interview and say what he says, believes the Bible says, and he's called vile. We read an article this week. Glad has received more blowback on their statements against him than anything they've ever said. They're, get, they're, get, they're catching it right and left. The Gay Lesbian uh, uh, Association Defense or whatever that stupid thing stands for. Uh, perverts on, for, for the devil. That's not love. Let me tell you something, folks. Love does not say it's okay to sin. That's that Dr. Spock junk from the 60s that all, all the parents did that. Don't spank your child. You're teaching it. No, you beat that child for being stupid. The rod, this, what, Spock says you spank them and you teach them to, to hit. The Bible says the rod of correction drives rebellion from his heart. And then it says if you spare the rod, you hate your child. Amen. Now Spock says you're teaching the wrong thing. The Bible says you hate them. Now who are you going to listen to? Some guy named Spock. He didn't have pointy ears, by the way. That was Leonard Nimoy. Or the Bible. We got, to see, we got to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We got to do it the way the Lord said it. Well, Jesus didn't do that. I, I read some stuff where people said that you know, Jesus was, would, would be, you know, uh, uh, offended by these statements. Jesus would be embracing them. No, Jesus wouldn't. When, he caught, when the woman was caught in adultery in the very end, they brought her to him. He said, I, he says, where are your accusers? He said, she says, I have none. He says, neither do, I, uh, neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more. He did not say it was okay what she was doing. He said, I'm not going to condemn you, but don't you stop sinning. So he did not accept her activity as okay. Are you here? People say, because well, Jesus never said a word about homosexuality in the Bible. He didn't say anything about raping little babies either. That don't make it okay. He didn't say anything about pedophilia. That don't make it okay. Are you here? You can't say just because Jesus didn't say anything about it, it makes it okay. He did not say a word about incest. He didn't say a word about rape. Just forget children, rape. He didn't say anything about rape. That don't make it okay. According to that logic, it means if somebody goes out and rapes somebody, you shouldn't get back because Jesus didn't say anything about it. That's messed up logic. I said that's messed up logic. According to their logic, Raping people is somebody's sexual predisposition. They're just born that way. They're like they have the power and control in that type of relationship. And so we shouldn't condemn them for doing it. We should say, you know, allow them to do it because that's normal for them. They were born that way. Hello? See, there's arguments that the, the, world, the things that seem right to a man, but the way they're in or the path they're in or the end thereof is death. When you start figuring that in your head and leave God's moral compass, you're going to get in trouble. 
Now that brings us back to this. Jesus is our Kyrios. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Master. We do it the way He said do it. And we've got to start teaching people that we have to submit to the Lordship of Christ. I don't want to. Fine. I got, I got, uh, 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 my, 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 um, witnessing technique has not been proven and tried enough, but, uh, you know, shake or bake, turn or burn, try or fry. It's a joke. <laughs> it really is a joke. All right. Where was I? Yep. He must reign to all enemies to put on your feet. This dominion of Christ is, though only visible to the faithful. The Old Testament witness to God as Yahweh, or Y-H-W-H, is remarkably, remarkably applied to Jesus consistently in the New Testament. Here the New Testament is uniquely underscoring the reality that Jesus is Lord in the divine sense. In the New Testament, almost 20 New Testament allusions and citations to Psalm 110 are applied to Jesus. Out of Psalm 110. Um, the goal of the Christian exhortation is to encourage the believer to place every aspect of his life under the lordship of Christ. But in your hearts, separate, uh, set apart Christ as Lord. That's 1 Peter 3.15. Uh, to confess Christ as Lord, listen to this, oh. To confess Christ as Lord. Y'all ready for this? One must be willing to faithfully carry out his perfect will. Any distortion of Christ's commands results in catastrophe. Jesus asked this question in Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? The one confessing Christ as Lord and not doing his will has built his, his faith on sand. We got too many people teaching that you can have him as Lord and live like you want to live. You're living on sand. And what's going to happen? Well, Jesus told us what happens when you build your life on sand. The storm will come. The same storms that come to everybody. The winds will blow. The stream will beat vehemently upon it. And it will fall. Because it was not built on the rock. It's built on sand. I'm building mine on the word. If you're not living, if he's not your Lord, you're not building it on the word. What's that old song? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. You can't build your life on Christ unless he's your Lord. Because Romans chapter 10, we read it earlier, chapter 10, verses 8, 9, and 10. He says, if you, believe, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, curios, supreme controller, commander, ruler, master of your life, and believe in your heart God's raises from the dead, you shall be saved. The confession of his lordship means you've come into a place of agreement. He's Lord of your life. Now, let me say something, folks. There is, I know, I know, I know, people are teaching, you don't have to obey. If he's your Lord, you do have to obey. But I'm under grace, it's already done for me. He's your Lord. See, people... I, uh, somebody said that, you know, somebody said the other day on, on, on a teaching, said, you know, uh, God's side is the grace side. Our side is the faith side. What side should we be operating in? The grace of God has made provision for it. The faith of God receives it, acts on it. And it takes faith to follow his commands. Because you don't, you don't always know where he's taking you. You don't see it. You do know this. It's going to be good. It's always going to be good. You may be going through a hard place, but I say keep your, keep your eye on him because when you come out, you're coming out on the other side, it's going to be good. He's not going to hurt you. He's not going to leave you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Oh, amen. Praise God. He makes a way of escape where there is no way. Glory to God. He's a good God. But he's your Lord. You have to obey his command. You have to follow him. You have to do what he says to do when he says do it. If he says jump how high and how, when, to, when can I come back down, sir? Amen. Well, that's not the relationship. I want a relationship. I want a, I want a relationship where we pal around together. Let me say something. The Lord likes to hang out. He likes to be, he, he wants to be in fellowship with you. 
But you can't ever cross that line. And people do this all the time with pastors. He's not my pastor. He's my friend. Usually what ends up happening is that means that they can get away with stuff that you can't get away with in any other aspect of the relationship. That you, you know, and it's the human nature. It's the hardest thing in the world to balance between the line. And we do that with the Lord. And we start teaching things that aren't Bible. We start teaching things, aspects of the relationship that aren't Bible. You have to maintain. And my pastor used to tell me, he told me all the time, that we, the church we came out of, he said, Ed, just call me John. I said, I can't do it, Pastor. I said, I know, I know that we're peers, that we're both ministers, we're both pastors, but you're my pastor. That's what I'm telling you. Yeah. Even, even, even now that we don't have that same relationship like we had because we're, we're you know, we're, I'm, I'm connected with Raymond in a certain way, he, I still call him pastor. Because he'll always be a pastor in my life, someone I respect. And just out of sheer respect, it maintains a certain relationship that if I need to go to him for something, I can go to him as a pastor and not as my buddy. You watch how you, watch how you treat the Lord. You need to maintain that relationship. He's your Lord. See, if somebody's just your pal and they ask you to do something, ah, I ain't got to do that. I'll tell you where you really see this is in employment situations where people have been buddies and one of them gets promoted to supervisor. What ha it's the hardest thing in the world for people who are, who are buddies to listen to them now. Oh, that's Jimmy. That's just Jimmy. We, went, we go out all the time. And all of a sudden, he, he can't go out anymore. Why? It's not good for, the, for his position. You've changed. No, you can't, handle, you can't handle the change. And see, this is why it's so important. When you walk with the Lord, he's still your Lord. He may be the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's always there for you. He loves you. He'll bless you. He'll do all kinds of things. He's still Lord, which means when he says jump, you jump. And I'm going to tell you something. The most people had the problem with it. I, 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 why do you make me say things like this? I'm telling you. There are times I wish, why can't I be like the guys who say the stuff everybody loves? <laughs> Honestly. Most of the time, the people who have the hardest time with the submission are the people who have authority problems. They, they're never going to be the pastor. The pastor's never going to be the pastor. It's going to be the buddy. Because they got an authority problem. If you've got an authority problem, you'll never learn to walk in faith. And you'll never learn to live victorious. The centurion told Jesus, when Jesus said he was coming to his house to heal his servant, he said, you don't need to come to my house. Because I am a man set under authority. And I say to this one, go. And he goeth to this one, come. And he cometh. And to another, do this. And he doeth it. Speak the word only. And Jesus looked and said, I've not found a man with so much faith in all of Israel. Why? Because he was submitted to authority, therefore he could exercise authority. So I'm asking you today, what are you going to do with the Lordship of Jesus? Jesus is not looking to come in your life solely as a lifesaver. He's not a life preserver. He's not, you know, that's not what he's here for. He is here for all of you. I said he's here for all of you. He's here for every aspect of your life. He's here, when he, when he saved you and redeemed you and brought you back into relationship with the Father, you had to confess him as your Lord. Now, you charismatic word of faith, righteousness, and believing people uh, better straighten up. I believe the word, but I'm just giving you the word. We got people, I, I, I believe every word. From Genesis to Revelation, everything in between. Then you can say what the word says. I don't believe that. I don't like that. Tough. I know. See, that's what, that's what gets me in so much trouble. I say things like tough when you don't want when it's, uh, instead of saying, oh, it's okay, honey. I remember one time I was on that Ask the Pastor program, and some lady called in and uh, said, you know, well, I, I send my tie to this one, my tie to that one, my tie to this one, and I'm having financial trouble. Da, da, da. I said, and that's why I answered. I said, well, your problem is you need to take it to your local church. So the, said bring the, your tithe, the Bible says bring your tithe to the storehouse. Well, she don't have a church. Well, you need to find one. Yeah. Television so-and-so ain't your pastor. 
Might be a good minister, might minister good things. He don't get your tithe either. Tithe goes to the local storehouse. Ooh. We have, right over here at the church, we have healing for toes that got stepped on. I'll pray for you. We'll get them healed. You go back out of here. You had the word and got your toes healed all at the same time. Isn't that just wonderful? I don't like how he preaches. Listen, you can go anywhere and get syrup. But it'll mess with your blood sugar. You need, some, you need some meat. You need to get slapped upside the head with a T-bone. Primarily the bone part. <laughs> some of y'all got that. <laughs> Hello? When we come in and submit to his lordship and do what he says do, see, he's the Lord. He's supreme commander. He demands things out of your life. It's not about coming in, you know, and, not, and just not going to hell. That's part of it. Thank God. And some of you, when you first got saved, that's all you think, man, I'll do anything the Lord tells me to do. And then somebody came along and told you something that wasn't true. Oh, you don't have to do that. God don't care what you do. He loves you. Well, he does love you. He loved you while you were dead in your sins. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He raised us up together, made us sit together with heaven, in heavenly places in Christ. He loved you while you were a sinner, even while you were yet sinners. That's why G Jesus came while we were all sinners. But he said, confess me as Lord. Submit your life to him. He's not the babe in the manger. He's not the babe in swaddling clothes. And the angels up in the sky singing. The shepherd standing at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the opening of the manger. All the other songs we got, he's not there. He grew up, went to the cross. He's not there. He's taken down and laid in the tomb. Went to the tomb. He's not there. He was raised up from the dead. They all went out and saw him go and sin. And the angels came back and said, why are you looking up in the sky? This same Jesus will return in like manner. And then Paul wrote and said, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for you. But he is both Lord and Christ. Today I challenge you. It's time that we in the church the charismatic Pentecostal um, uh, word of faith circle, Gracie, church. Understand, Jesus is not, he's not your sugar daddy. He's not the ATM you could just make withdrawals from when you have some kind of need. It's okay to go to the ATM if you have a, listen, I'm going to tell you something. Now, I'm sure Cap has an ATM card. I can't go up there and try to use my card to get money out of his account. Why? I don't have that relationship with him. I'm not on his, I'm not on his account. If you're going to confess Jesus as Lord, you need to walk in that relationship with him. You got a lot, like we said the other day, you've got a lot of people trying to make withdrawals out of an account they haven't invested in. They just want the benefits. And the Bible said, you can, see, see we, we have people pray prayers. Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I accept uh, I, and come into my heart. Or actually, sometimes we can call him Lord. Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. But Paul said you confess him as Lord. That's what Paul said. When you come to the Lord and you confess him as Lord, you're telling him when that statement. See, we, we should teach this to people. Instead of just trying to hook them in, come shake the preacher's hand and you're in the church. Hello? Join our rock climbing wall group and you're in the church. You're going to heaven. Hello? Meet for ladies tea every other month on the third Saturday morning at 10 a.m. and you're going to heaven. No, you're not. You'll just go to hell soothed with your green tea. Tea with spirits. <laughs> tea with spirits. Mm. Janet's going to take over and finish my sermon. Lord have mercy. Tea with spirits. No, you come in by submission to his lordship. What's that mean? You give it up. You, you give everything up for him. I'm going, I'm going to follow him. Lord, all my life, I've, you know, what shall I do? Well, keep, you know, keep his commandments. Out of the, all these things I've done for my youth, one more thing you need to do. Go sell all you got, give it to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. He went away. He wasn't, see, 
the Lord knew his riches were a weight around his neck and he wasn't willing to give up everything to serve the Lord. Are you willing just to throw all the whole, all, all of you to follow him? He might tell you to go to Africa. Is that the low hum of the HVAC unit or is that low hum of your brains trying to get those gears to move? <laughs> Sell out to Jesus. The babe in the manger has come, been raised from the dead. The babe in the manger is now Lord in Christ. The babe in the manger now sits at the right hand of God as King of kings and Lord of lords, the potentate of all potentates, master and commander. Are you yielded to him? So next, this week, as you're singing away in a manger, we'll probably sing that. Are we singing that tonight? Is that one of the songs y'all guys got? Okay. Make it work. Like the candlelight service tonight, we're going to sing some of the songs I talked about this morning. <laughs> it's okay to celebrate it. I'm just saying the only reason we're celebrating is because he went to the cross and he's Lord. You know, they celebrate Washington's birthday and Lincoln's birthday. Uh, because they were great presidents. Who would never, if, if, if Lincoln had not won the presidency and, and had the Civil War and all that stuff, we, would, we wouldn't have Lincoln's birthday as a holiday. <coughs> Hello? If Columbus hadn't discovered America, we wouldn't celebrate Columbus Day. If Jesus hadn't gone to the cross and been raised from the dead, we wouldn't celebrate Christmas. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this time together. We thank you that Jesus is our Lord. Lord, we yield and submit and honor him through our lives. Lord, peradventure, there be one here today that does not and has not yielded their lives to your lordship. Thank you. You've dealt with their hearts. You've moved upon them. The Holy Spirit has convinced them of their need to yield their life to him. If you're here this morning, have you, hey, I'll just ask you to close your eyes at least. If you're here this morning and you're not born again, you haven't yielded to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you. Anybody here, you've done, just not given it all to Jesus. You know, you're not committed to his Lordship. Raise your hand. All right. Anybody here this morning, you have in the past, but you took it back. You say, well, I'm not going to listen to him anymore when I start doing your own thing. Well, he's not Lord if you're not doing what he says do. Anybody here that you've gone your way, doing it your way? You're singing with Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. That don't, work, that don't work in the kingdom. Anybody? All right, praise the Lord. Look up at me. Hallelujah. Just want to, we want to leave you with this before Christmas. Couldn't you have done it? Well, tonight we'll get the sweet side. We'll do the sweet stuff tonight, all right? This is a challenge by the Spirit of God. See, there's stuff going on in the body of Christ. There are things happening. The enemy's at work. The enemy's afoot. And we, as the church, have to walk in sync with the head of the church and the command of the head of the church.